The following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high-quality educational resources for free. To make a donation or to view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. Start by um, reminding you what we did uh, uh, in last lecture. And in particular, um, there was a little bit um, um, uh, confusion. Uh, seems like uh, maybe some part that went too fast. So, so I will um, try to, um, yeah. Um, So again, we start, say, by choosing the worksheet metric to be the Minkowski. Then, then the worksheet action just reduce to that of a, a bunch of free scalar fields. Just reduce to a bunch of free scalar fields. And those free scalar field is a bit unusual because, in particular, there's a zero component, which will have a wrong sign kinetic term. Okay, but of course this is not our full story. You still have to impo uh, impose the uh, so-called the um, Varasoro constraint, uh, corresponding to that the stress tensor of this series should be zero. So, which is the consequence of the equation motion for gamma. And you can, but nevertheless, you can write down the most general solution to this problem. So let me write it here. So the most general of, of a closed stream, so the most general solution can be written as x mu plus p mu tau So, so I've now written the, um, what I called previously by XL and the XR, I have written them explicitly in terms of the Fourier modes, okay? Uh, and I have written them explicitly in terms of Fourier modes. And uh, uh, they're in this form. So in compare with uh, what we discussed before, previous here we called P mu, V mu, then we discussed last time that the, this V mu should be considered uh, as relates to the center of mass momentum of the whole string. And uh, for example, for the closed string, that's the relation. Okay. So similarly, for the open string, similarly for the open string, if you use the Luhmann boundary condition, if you use the Luhmann boundary condition, then you find the. Uh, again, I will substitute the explicit expression. For the for the XL and the XR, so now become two upper prime p mu tau. So again, this is our previous v mu. So this two is related to like the uh, open string sigma only go from zero to pi rather than two pi. And then you can write the the oscillator. Yeah, this XL XR in terms of the explicit uh, free transform. So here you only have one set of modes. N sigma. Okay? And the course N sigma just come from we have XL plus XR and XL which is equal to XR. And uh, yeah, when these two become the same, when these two become the same, then these two combine. Because the sigma have opposite sign that combine to cos N sigma. Okay? Yeah, at cos M sigma. So this is the most general uh, 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 classical solution. And in the light con gauge, 
you know, let's congage this x plus can be set into 0. And also, everything related to alpha plus, alpha tilde plus, all the oscillation modes also set to be 0, related to the plus set to 0. So there's only tau term left in the net gauge. And uh, these Villasoro constraints, they become, and the Villasoro constraints, they become, I have tau x minus. So this v plus is the same as that uh, 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 related to the p plus that way. Okay. So in those equations, so the i should be considered as a sum. Okay, you sum over all directions, all transverse directions. So from the Velasoro constraint, you can deduce x minus. You can deduce x minus. Yeah, again, let me just write here. Our convention is always x mu is equal to x plus x minus then xi. And i goes from 2 to d minus 1. And x plus minus is, say, 1 over square root 2, x0 plus minus x1. OK? So from here, you can deduce the x minus. And also, it means that independent variables So this will determine the, the x minus up to a constant, because this determines the tau and the sigma derivative and up to a constant. So the independent variables are xi. And then also this p, p plus or v plus, which appears in the plus, and then the x minus, the zero modes for the for the x minus, which is not determined by those things. And, uh, uh, and these two, uh, this is just a constant. And again, these two are constant. These are, are, are two dimensional fields, OK? Any questions so far? Good. So, so as we emphasize that the zero mode part of this equation are particularly important. So zero part, of the, uh, 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 yeah, let me call this equation one. This equation two. So the zero part of those equations are particularly important. And uh, for example, say from equation one, so the zero mode part for the first equation, say let's do the for the uh, uh, say let's do the for closed string, then then zero mode part is just uh, it's just uh, 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 alpha prime p minus. Okay, if you take derivative over tau, so you just get the alpha prime p minus, and the right hand side. So right hand side, let me, uh, uh, let me also rewrite the v plus in terms of alpha prime. So this is two alpha prime p plus. And the zero mode means that you, you integrate over, you integrate over or, or, or the string. OK? So this is the first equation. And the, so the zero mode equation becomes like that. So now let me just uh, 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 make a brief comment, which I, I uh, um, uh, uh, at the beginning I forgot to mention last time, which uh, uh, 
then apparently caused some confusion later, is that if you look at this expression, okay, this is actually precisely, so if you look at that two-dimensional field theory, this is actually precisely the Hamiltonian, the classical Hamiltonian for that field theory, okay, for the xi part. Okay, uh, uh, this is just a free scalar field theory. And so, so I can, yeah, so uh, in particular, so, so let me write that more precise. Let's take out this p plus, and then this becomes two, uh, 4 pi alpha prime, and then this just becomes exactly the Hamiltonian of that theory corresponding to for the xi. Okay? So, so hxi is the Hamiltonian. for two-dimensional quantum fields, quantum field theory of xi. For the transverse directions, OK? So you can also write this ex explicitly in terms of those modes. In terms of those modes, then for example, you write p minus, yeah, if you can also write the modes, then become p minus equal to 2p plus pi square plus 1 over alpha prime. So if you just substitute those expansion into here, then you can also write it explicit in terms of modes. And then Okay. And uh, then you can combine, so, so this is p minus, then you can multiply this to the other side, combine all the p together. You can write it as m square, which is defined to be p mu, p mu minus p mu, p mu, which is then 2p plus p minus minus p i square. And then this then become equal to 1 alpha, 1 alpha, and 1 alpha prime sum m equal to 0 alpha minus m i alpha m i plus alpha tilde minus m i alpha tilde m i. OK? Then you see that the, this constraint for, for p prime, for p minus, now can be written, can be rewritten in terms of the relation of the mass of the whole string in terms of its oscillation modes. Okay? In terms of its oscillation modes. And similarly uh, for the open string, so this is for the closed string, for the open. The exact the same thing applies, just you only have now one set of modes. And uh, um, so remember, in those expressions, uh, uh, um, i is always, sum over i is always assumed. And whenever I wrote m equal to zero, m not equal to zero means you always sum from minus infinity to plus infinity, and except for m equal to zero. Okay. Uh, uh, yeah. Yes. Any questions? So this is the consequence of the zero modes for one, and the consequence for the zero modes for two. Again, you can just integrate over all stream, uh, 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 all direction of the stream. Then, then the left hand side just gets zero. Because the x minus is a periodic function. So this is a total derivative. And so this uh, gives you exactly zero. And then this then put the constraint.
on the right hand side uh, uh, on this expression, which can be written explicitly. So you can also then plug into the explicit modes, and then they become some m not equal to 0 alpha minus mi alpha mi equal to OK, so, so this is sometimes called a level matching condition. So this tells you that the oscillation from the left moving part, this is for the closed string. For the open string, this e equation just does not give you anything. For the closed string, this gives you a long trivial constraint. Oh, I got a win. <laughs> 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 so, so for closed string, this just tells you that the left moving part and the right moving part have to be balanced. And, uh, and this is related to that string is periodic. Along the string is periodic, so there's no special point on the string. And then, then there's no special. Then you can actually not distinguish between the left moving and the right moving part. Okay. Good. So this is the uh, 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 the whole classical story. So the classic. Uh, 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 this is a, in some sense the complete classical story. Okay. And then, uh, so quantum mechanically, we just need to uh, uh, quantize those guys. Quantize those guys. And those are just ordinary quantum mechanical degrees freedom we don't need to worry about. Uh, and, uh, and this just become a, a, um, a quantization of a, a free scalar field theory. OK? Uh, when you say free scalar, so all these modes are massive, or is there any condition they can be massless? No, no, no. This is a massless field theory. We are quantizing this theory, right? Yeah, so this is massless scalar field theory in two dimension. Uh, so that mass is? No, this mass is the mass of the string. No, this is the mass of the center of, uh, this is the total mass of the string. Yeah, not the, uh, uh, when I say the massless, this is a massless scalar field theory in the watt sheet. Yeah. This is a space time description. Uh, uh, so we should separate, it's important to separate two things. Things, uh, things happen on the world sheet, and things happen in space time. And uh, so this is the mass of the string viewed uh, 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 as object moving in the space time. And when I say uh, uh, quantizing a massive scalar field theory uh, is to think of those, uh, uh, the mo uh, so xi essentially describe the motion of the string, think of them uh, as a field theory on the world sheet, and that's a massive field theory. Yes? Is there an explicit definition of momentum of the string? Uh, 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 it's, the, it's the conserved loss of charge for the string, uh, corresponding to the translation. It's the conserved loss of charge corresponding to the translation. Yeah, so, uh, so that's what we derived last time. So we show that this V, what would be original red V here, are related to the, to the center of mass momentum in this particular way. Yes? Sorry, which one? The fact that it's alpha prime minus yeah. Alpha yeah. Do you use it anyway, or it's just a remark? No, uh, uh, this is a remark, and this will make a more lateral. Uh, for us, this is not essentially, uh, uh, for us, this is not the essential remark, but it will be more lateral. When I, when I, um, when we work out the zero point energy, and uh, <laughs> uh, when we work out zero point energy, then that's a more lateral uh, uh, thing to consider because that can uh, will actually give you a, a way of the computing zero point energy. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Because you have n <laughs> times. Sorry? Num you're supposed to have n times, alpha n times other number of alpha. Right. So, sorry, what are you saying? So, so here, if you plug in this here, you, you, and in the end, you got alpha minus n times alpha n. Yeah. But if you do 
Yeah. Oh, this is a trivial to see. We can see it immediately here. First, if you take the derivative, you just get the pi. Yes. And then you just get that term. And when you take derivative here, then you cancel the m. Yes. And then in order to get the zero mode, then the m and the m minus m have to cancel. So the only structure uh, uh, can happen is this one. Then the only thing left remaining is to check the coefficient here is 1. And, uh, and that we have to do the calculation. And, uh, and the rest, you don't need to do the calculation. Yeah, the only thing to do the calculation is for this one. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, just kind of to overview. So all we're doing is um, free fields in a two-dimensional world sheet with a diffeomorphism based invariance as a gauge symmetry. And that gauge symmetry gives us some complicated constraints, yeah, that's which right. we then get rid of. Solve that constraint. Solve yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, that's all there is. Yeah, yeah, that's right. So as I said before, solving the constraint helps you two things. First, you solve this constraint. And the second, you get rid of this x plus and x minus. And because x plus, because those are the dangerous field theory, and now we get rid of. And, uh, and what remaining xi are, are, are good, well-behaved. They're good boys. They're, uh, they're, they're, they're good, well-behaved field series. Any other questions? So, yeah, yeah. Question. so is it known how to do basically string theory? In, in, well, is, is it known how to do this to deal with the, uh, the polycuff action not in the light cone cage? Oh, yeah, sure. Okay. Yeah, but that takes much longer time. OK. Got it. Even in the light cone gauge, <laughs> I'm still trying to tell in the story, telling a long story short. Okay. And so I'm trying to give you the essence. And, uh, but to make sure, uh, but I'm trying to tell you the essence, but at the same time, I want you to understand. Uh, so make sure you answer the, uh, 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 you ask whatever, it's not clear. But, for example, in the next semester's undergraduate, a string theory for undergraduate, you will reach this point essentially after maybe 15 lectures. And, uh, and we reached here maybe only two or three lectures. <laughs> and, uh, and so uh, uh, as I try to just give you the essence and, uh, and try to uh, not to give you too many technical details, say cross checks, et cetera. And there are many cross checks you can do, et cetera. Yeah, I'm not doing those things. Just give you the essence. Got it. Right. Any other questions? Good. OK, so, so now we can, so this is the review of the classical story. So now let's do the quantum story. Again, this is a just quick review of what we did last time. So quantum mechanically, this just become, uh, 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 all those become operators. All those become operators. And alpha also become operators. OK. So this commutator, as we said the last time, implies that square over square root alpha mi should be considered as a standard uh, uh, annihilation operators for m greater than 0. And uh, the mode with the negative m should be considered as the creation operators. OK, creation operators. And then this is like the standard a uh, 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 quantization of field theory, you reduce to an infinite number of harmonic oscillators. And in particular, this product just reduced to m times this ami dagger, ami just become m mmi. OK? So mmi is the oscillation, uh, oscillator number occupation number, say for each harmonic oscillator. 
And then, then the typical state, then the typical state of the system gets obtained by acting those things on the vacuum. For example, for the open string, we only have one set of modes. So then we'd have this form, m1, m1, alpha minus m2, i2, n2 on the vacuum. And the vacuum also have a quantum number p mu because, the, because, uh, 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 because those p, p, both p plus and the pi here are quantum operators. And so, so we take the vacuum to be eigenstate of them. And they are independent of those alphas. So, uh, so this vacuum is the only vacuum for the oscillators. And, but they are still labeled by a space-time momentum. OK? So labeled by the space-time momentum of the string. So this is for the open string. For the open string. And for the closed string, for the closed string, similarly, you just have two sets of modes, minus i1, n1, alpha minus m2, i2, n2. And then also you have the other, say let me call it k1, j1, l1, alpha minus k2, j2, l2, etc. on the vacuum. So this is a typical state for the closed string. But the allowed state should still satisfy this constraint. OK, should still satisfy this constraint. So this constraint can be written as with the, with the following constraint. It says the oscillator number on the left hand side uh, uh, for the left moving modes, uh, or tilde. And, uh, and the oscillator number for the right moving modes, they have to be the same. So, so, uh, so let me rewrite this equation in terms of oscillator numbers. Uh, so, so this means i sum. So let me now write them from m to infinity. So m and i. OK? So this is just from that equation, OK? So this is sometimes called, yeah, so this is called the level matching condition. So for closed string, you cannot just act arbitrarily alpha and alpha tilde. The number of modes the total thing you act from the left hand side, uh, from the uh, uh, alpha, and those from the tilde, they have to be balanced by this equation. Okay, uh, which is the consequence that there's no spatial point on the string. OK. So, so now we can also rewrite those equations at the quantum level. OK. So those equations at the quantum level, those equations just tells you that for those states, for those states, the p mu are not arbitrary. p mu are not arbitrary. p mu must satisfy this kind of constraint. P mu must satisfy this kind of constraint. And uh, uh, that can in turn be interpreted as the uh, determine the mass of the string. OK? Determine the mass of the string. So, so the mass of the string, then the, for the open, the mass of string can be written 1 over alpha prime, sum over i, sum over m and y, when to infinity, m and m i, then plus some zero point energy. 
So, so this is just the frequency of each mode. So this is just a frequency of the uh, each mode, uh, uh, a frequency of each mode, and this is the uh, occupation number. So this is the standard harmonic oscillator uh, uh, result. And uh, um, then at the quantum level, of course, there's ordering issue because the the alpha m and m don't commute. So because one is creation, one is annihilation operator, so the ordering here matters. So the ordering here matters. So in principle, uh, 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 um, um, yeah, uh, 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 matters. Similarly, you can write it. So that will create, uh, 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 give rise to this uh, 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 this uh, uh, zero point energy or ordering uh, number. So similarly, for the for the closed stream, then you just have uh, two sets of modes. Similarly, okay. I'll say zero. So a zero. Can be so. He, so this is the place. This remark is useful because the because the uh, this just come from. This just come from essentially this part just come from essentially it's just the Hamiltonian of the xi and just xi uh, viewed as a field theory on the word sheet. And the field theory of xi essentially is a bunch of harmonic oscillators. And the, uh, for each harmonic oscillator, we do know what is the ordinary number. It's just one half, the zero point energy, just one half. And then you just add all of them together. Okay, just add all of them together. So, so for example, for the open string, so this just become alpha d minus two, the d minus two because the d minus two direct directions, and then you sum m equal to infinity, one half omega. Okay, one half omega and, uh, and omega is m. Then I told you this beautiful trick last time that this should be equal to d minus two divided by twenty-two divided by twenty-four. One of alpha prime because this guy, because sum o m one to infinity m uh, give you minus one twelfths. Okay, so this is for the open. So similarly for the closed string, uh, you can do the similar thing, just differ by some two, uh, etc. So this gives you d minus two, twenty four, four divided by alpha prime, closed. So this vacuum energy, so, so this can also be interpreted as a vacuum energy on the circle, vacuum energy of this quantum field theory on the circle. And in quantum field theory, this is sometimes called the Casimir energy. And, uh, uh, and you can check yourself that those answers are, uh, agree with the standard the, uh, 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 expression for the Casimir energy on the circle. Um, yeah, if you choose your unit properly, because we have chosen the uh, the size to be two pi, okay? Good, so this summarize what we did, uh, uh, summarize what the, uh, 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 we did so far. Uh, um, any questions on this? Good. No more questions. Every, everything is crystal clear. Then I should have immediately have a quiz. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So, so the twenty-six dimensions comes from making this zero. Yeah. Uh, um, no. No. If you put the twenty-six here, this is not zero. I'm sorry. Making this. I'm sorry. I'm making it one over. I apologize. Not zero. So I was just observing. So the twenty-six dimensions because comes from the fact that somehow twenty-six minus two over twenty-four is one. It's like a piece of numerology, but it's like yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah, that's a very good observation. Uh, 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 that's exactly the reason I write it in this way. <laughs> right. So so let me just make a comment. Yeah, maybe I make a comment later. 
<laughs> anyway, so, so from here, from these two expression, from this expression and this expression, you see this picture which I said at the beginning. So each of these describe a state of a string. And the, uh, uh, the state of a string, uh, 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 the state of such a string, they, they oscillate in this particular way. Say they have, uh, 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 say they have this, uh, 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 those oscillation modes. And then they move in space time with such a center of mass momentum. Okay, with such a center of mass momentum. So such object is, you look at it from afar, it's just like a particle, okay? It's just like a particle. So, so we have established it. So now let's look at the uh, uh, spectrum. So each of a string of a, so each state of a string can be considered a map to a space time particle. Okay, so let's now work out, and uh, and uh, uh, and the mass of the particle can be worked out by those formulas. Okay, so let's now just work out what are the nightest particles, because we are interested in the nightest particles, typically. Okay. So so now let's start from the beginning. Now, so now let's start with open string. So, so, the, so the lowest mode, of course, is just the vacuum, P mu. OK, there's no oscillators. So for such a mode, N, N M i just equal to 0 for all m and i. OK? And uh, so this is, should be just a space-time scalar. So this should describe a space-time scalar because the, there's no uh, there's no other quantum number other than the momentum. So it should be a space-time scalar. So it should be the, uh, uh, should should describe a scalar particle. Describe a scalar particle. And the mass of the particle we can just read from here. And uh, so the m square equal to malus. So this is for the open string. So we use this formula. Because that's the only thing, because this here is 0. So the only thing comes from a 0 term. So, so you just given by minus d minus 24 or t minus 2 divided by 24 sum over alpha prime. OK? So one immediate thing you notice is that this guy is smaller than 0 for d greater than 2. Say for any space-time dimension greater than two, uh, you actually find a mass square, an active mass square. So people actually give a fancy name for uh, for such kind of particle, they call tachyon. And in the sixties, actually people designed the experiment to look for such particles, uh, uh, particles of active mass, uh, negative mass square. Um, anyway, um, so uh, so these are the weird. Uh, yeah, we are not going to here. Let me just say for the following. Wait, in the in the theory, if you see excitations with a negative mass square, typically tells you that the system have instability, that you are not in the lowest energy state. Okay, you're not in the lowest state. So, so what this tells you is that this open, uh, this open stream propagate in the flat Minkowski space time may not be the lowest configuration of the stream. But that is OK. Uh, uh, if you're not in the lowest configuration, uh, that's not, uh, 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 it's not a big deal. And uh, it just means we have not found the correct ground state. Does not mean the theory is inconsistent. OK? And, uh, and, and so, so, so even though this is unpleasant, 
but this thing is tolerable. Okay, this thing is tolerable. Any problem with this? Uh, but uh, you already set uh, all n equals to zero, so that is the ground state. No, this is a ground state on the watt sheet. But on the, in the space time, this corresponding to a particle, this corresponding to excitation in the space time. And so this corresponding to excitation in the space time with the negative mass square. And typically, if you have something with a negative mass square, let me just say one more word here, then that means you are sitting on the top of a hill. And that's where you have a, a, a negative mass square. And so it means you are in the, some kind of unstable state. But, uh, but of course, you are allowed to sit on the top of a hill. Yeah, it's not a big deal. Why, why is this unstable, like uh, more? Hmm? On the top of the hill, is it stable? No, no, no. <laughs> Why the hacking means on the top of the hill? Ah, if you write, uh, if you write a scalar field theory. Yeah, so, so this corresponding to a scalar field in space time now, OK? So now if I write a scalar field theory in space time, say, let me call phi, we select to mass square. So that means the potential for, uh, for this mass square is like this. Then that means that the, uh, uh, the phi wants to increase. Yeah. Is that the same thing as an example for spontaneous? Yeah, that's right. Similarly for spontaneous. But uh, except here, we don't know what is the bottom. Yeah, uh, we are just sitting on the top. Anyway, so later we will uh, find a way to get rid of this. Uh, so it's OK. So you don't need to worry about this here. So the second mode. The second noise mode, you just you add alpha minus 1 on, the, on this watt sheet ground state. OK? So now this thing is interesting. First, this index i, this index i, and this index i is a space time index. OK? It's a space time index. And so this actually means. This transform means this state actually transform as a vector under SOD minus 2, the rotation of the xi directions. And I, I remember, in the light con gauge, the Lorentz symmetry is broken. And this is the only uh, symmetry which is manifest. And so that suggests this state should be, should be a spacetime vector. Oh, okay, should be a space-time vector. So, 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 uh, so should be a space-time vector. So now let's work out its mass. So now m equal to one. So m equal to one, and so you just have one here. And uh, so, so uh, then you just put the one here. So this is the alpha prime 1 minus d minus 2 divided by 24. So this is 26 divided ma minus d divided by alpha prime. OK? So now you see the 26 oh, uh, divided by 24 alpha prime. So now you see this magic number 26. Okay, but now how? So now we emphasized before in the light quantum gauge, even though only this SO d minus two is manifest because you break Lorentz symmetry, the gauge break Lorentz symmetry. But your theory is still secretly Lorentz symmetric. Should still be Lorentz invariant because the string is propagated in the flat Minkowski space time. That means all your particle spectrum, they must fall into representations of the full Lorentz group. OK? They must fall into the representations of the full Lorentz group, even though the Lorentz symmetry is not manifest here. Okay. 
And now, let us recall an important fact. A Lorentz vector, a vector, a vector field, a Lorentz, yeah, just a vector particle. In D Minkowski space time, D dimensional Minkowski space time, if this particle is massive, then have D minus 1 independent. Uh, 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 components, say so independent modes. And if it's massless, then have d minus 2 independent modes. OK? So, so the situation we are familiar with is the d equal to 4, four-dimensional space time. So in four-dimensional space time, a massless vector is a photon. Photon have two polarizations, have two independent modes. And uh, but if we, it, but you have a vac but if you have a massive vector, then you actually have three uh, polarization rather than two. Okay. But now we see a problem. Here we see a vector. But this vector only have d minus two components. Okay. Here, because I because these are the only independent modes. Here. We have a vector which has only d minus 2 components, independent components. OK? So if you compare with this list, because there's nothing else, because these are the only independent modes here. OK? In the light gauge, there's nothing else. So by compare with our knowledge of the Lorentz symmetry, we conclude the only way this particle can be mathematically consistent is that it has to be a massless particle. So that means m squared have to be 0. OK? So, so m squared has to be 0 means that d must be equal to 26. OK? And uh, we actually find a massless particle, so we actually find the photon. So we actually find the photon, OK, in the string excitations. Yeah, one second. Let me just finish this. For d not equal to 26, the range symmetry is lost. The range symmetry is lost. It's because that means this particle, when m squared is not 0, no matter what, these states cannot fall into a representation of a Lorentz, symmetry, uh, uh, a Lorentz group. And uh, so it means that Lorentz symmetry is not maintained, even though Lorentz symmetry is a symmetry of the classical action, but it's not maintained at the quantum level. Somehow, in the quantization procedure, a symmetry which is, many, which is in your classical theory is lost. OK? And this tells you that the quantization is not consistent. Okay, it's inconsistent. Because, because it means, whatever it is, if you have something propagated in Minkowski space time, it has to fall into representations of the Lorentz group. That means that, yeah, this just cannot be the right, uh, you have to go back to redo your thing. Uh, uh, this is not propagating in the Minkowski space time. Okay? So, Alternatively, yeah, so this is the, uh, uh, a conclusion that d must be equal to 26, OK? 
So you can reach the same conclusion the following way. So, so right now, um, so the way we did this is that we, we fudged this A0. Yeah, uh, we did not fudge it, but, uh, but we did something uh, uh, to an infinite sum uh, and find the finite answer. Yeah, we have to do an infinite sum of a positive numbers <laughs> and then find the lactive number. And, uh, and, then, uh, and then we find somehow there's something uh, d minus 2 and d minus 1, somehow missing 1, somehow. Anyway. <laughs> anyway, but this is actually a deep story. It's not, say, just missing 1 or something like that. So you can reach the same conclusion by doing the following. Say you put here a 0 as undetermined coefficient. And it, t it turns out the same a 0. Yeah, so, so you can check. So here it tells you that Lorentz image is lost. So you can double check this conclusion uh, uh, as follows. So remember I, s uh, uh, I said that that classical action is invariant on the Lorentz symmetry. And then this conserves the loss of charge corresponding to the Lorentz, uh, Lorentz transformation. And those, those are charges that become generators of Lorentz symmetry at the quantum level, just in quantum field theory. And uh, then by consistency, those Lorentz conserve the Lorentz charges. As a quantum operator, they must satisfy Lorentz algebra. Okay? Then you can check with a general D and with a, a, a general A0. And the, that the Lorentz algebra is only satisfied in the d equal to 26 dimension and with A0 given by these formulas. Okay, so that will be a rigorous way to derive it. Okay, rigorous way to derive it. But then we are not doing it here because that will take a, lit, uh, will take a little bit of time. Does uh, that also involve the commutator of this mode? Hmm? Uh, this, that derivation also involves the commutator of this alpha mode. Yeah, then yeah. Then yeah. You, you also need to look at the one we had before. Sorry? Then you also, look, also need to look at the commutator. No, 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 no. You just uh, 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 assume some general A0 here. You determine this by, by requiring that the, the uh, Lorentz algebra is satisfied. Yeah, I mean, the Lorentz algebra, generating the Lorentz algebra is also written in terms of this mode. Yeah, yeah, in terms of alpha, that's right. And then in computing the commutator. Oh, the, the, those commutators are fine. Uh, uh, are those commutators just from standard condensation. Sorry, which 1 over 24? No, no, for, uh, forget about 1 over 24. There's no 1 over 24. Uh, there's no 1 over 24. Uh, 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 you just uh, 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 write a 0 here as undetermined constant and check it by consistency. Determined by consistency. Yeah, no. Yes? Uh, sorry? I mean, we we'll have to work d minus four dimensions anyway. Yeah. So then, shouldn't we then say that to begin with, like, Minkowski space d is just not correct? Right, yeah. Uh, 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 so, so you will find actually uh, uh, this conclusion does not depend on the details. Uh, uh, it does not depend on details. And this, uh, 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 yeah, so, um, so you can generalize this uh, to, to more general case. Say curve space time, etc., and the curve space time is changed, uh, which you might uh, 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 then you find the same conclusion will uh, 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 will happen. Yeah, the same conclusion will happen, and uh, and then you reduce to four dimensions, then you will find the four dimension uh, uh, a massive vector which only have two polarizations. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, I mean, just say it doesn't matter. Uh, 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 this uh, is only a question as far as we have some uncompact directions. Okay. As far as we have some Lorentz directions, uh, and this will uh, uh, apply. Okay. Yeah. Yes? Uh, kind of going back a little bit to the yeah. axion thing, 
how do we know for a fact that the stream tension is positive? Because, for example, I think in like CCD streams, aren't, isn't the stream tension negative? Uh, not really. How do you define elective stream tension? A negative tension. I don't know. I just read that in QCD streams, they have negative stream tension. No, no. I think here, uh, uh, so alpha prime is just really, uh, uh, alpha prime is a scale. It's a physical scale. Uh, 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 yeah, uh, ten tension is, a, it's a, yeah, uh, it's, a, it's defined to be positive. Just by definition, it's positive. Other questions? Okay. So um, so let me just say a little bit more regarding So now we have found a tachyon and a massless vector. And also, we have fixed the space-time dimension to be 26. OK, we have fixed space-time dimension to be 26. So, so now, so if you fix, now fix d equal to 26, then the higher excitations are all massive. OK? So for the, for the photon, essentially, it's this guy. So this guy is negative. This guy cancels this guy. So when you go to higher, higher excitation, then this guy will dominate. And the m squared will be all positive. And the scale is controlled by this one over alpha prime. OK? So, so it will be all massive with spacing given by, say, uh, 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 1 over alpha prime. So, so with the spacing m squared given by 1 over alpha prime. For example, the next level would be so alpha minus 1, alpha minus 1, some i, some j, or alpha minus 2, i, acting on 0 p. OK? So those things acting on, yeah, uh, 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 to avoid confusion, let me write it more clearly. So this acting on 0 p and alpha minus 2, I on zero p. Okay. So this would be like a tensor because this have two index, and this again like a vector. Again like a vector. So 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 those will be the mass square one of alpha prime. Of alpha prime. And you can check that actually they actually fall into the uh, they fall nicely into representations of the Lorentz group. Okay. For a uh, 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 license to representation of the range group. Yes? Um, where is the one with only one index getting its x root free? Uh, uh, sorry, say it again. So the one with one index, suppose, since it's massive, it's supposed to have d minus one degrees of freedom, right? They have. Uh, um, d ah, one ah, ah. So oh, yeah, yeah, what's happening? Uh, 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 that's a very good question. Uh, so, so what's happening? He said this should give rise to a tensor uh, it should give a tensor representation, but this is not enough, and this acts together to form a tensor representation. Uh, okay. Yeah, because this because I only go, going from one to uh, from two to d minus one, so you need to add them together. Yeah. Good. So, so just to summarize the st story for the open stream, we find the tachyon, we find the massless vector, which is. To be inter uh, can be interpreted maybe as a photon, and then you find lots of massive particles, infinite number of uh, 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 massive particles. OK? So any other questions, or do you want to have a break? We are a little bit out of time. Um, yeah, maybe let me give you a three minutes break. <laughs> yeah, 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 let's have a break now. So again, the lowest state is just the 0 p. And then again, all the n is 0. All the n are 0. So you just read from the answer from here. Then the m square for the closed string is just equal to a 0 for the closed string. So, so here is now 
m square minus alpha 4 divided by alpha prime d minus 2 divided by 24. So again, this is tachyonic for d greater than 2. Okay, uh, uh, tachyonic for d greater than 2. And this is a scalar. And this is a scalar. Because there's no other quantum number. Okay. Yeah, so now we are familiar with the tachyon, so we don't need to worry about it. So let's look at the next. So next, naively, you may say, let's do this one as open string case. But this is not allowed. OK, this is not allowed. Why? That's right. It does not satisfy this condition. Because this one, you only have the left moving excitations, but does not have the right moving excitations. You are not balanced. So, so you also need to add, so the, so the next one will be this guy. OK? So now, oh, here I have a J. Now I have a J. So this will have m square twenty six minus d divided by twenty alpha four alpha prime. Six alpha prime. So now you can uh, again now look for what the rent what representations of the Lorentz group will give you this? Again, you find none unless you are in the d equal to 26. OK? The same story happens. The same story happens, again, only for d equal to 26 for into representations. Of Lorentz group. At which the m square again is massless, m square is massless. So it turns out actually this does not transform under. Irreducible representation of a Lorentz group. It's actually uh, 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 it's actually a reducible, so it can be separated into several s s subsets. So so this can be further uh, decomposed to So you can take some all the i and j together, take the same i okay yeah, some i so take the take this guy have take these two, the index to be the same, and the sum over all the directions. so this does not transform under the rotation of eyes. So this is a scalar. So this is it's a massively scalar. OK? And you can also have the situation. So, so all the states are, are linear superposition of those states. Uh, so they are d minus 2. So they are d minus 2 times d minus 2 of them. OK, the d minus 2 times d minus 2 of them. So this uh, d minus 2, uh, uh, say the one of them can be, uh, uh, can be decomposed into a scalar. And I can also take the linear superposition of them with a symmetric traceless and the traceless 
So the trace part is essentially this scalar. And I can also take a trace list part, trace list EIJ, okay? because the, uh, the trace part is already covered by this one. I don't want to repeat. And this is precisely the generalization, what we normally call the spin two representation uh, 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 to general dimension. Okay? So we have found a massively spin two particle. So this is a massively spin two particle. And then you can also, of course, take it to be antisymmetric. So that's the only possibility now. Bij anti-symmetric in Ij. Okay. So this is sometimes. Uh, so this is called anti-symmetric. Uh, so this will give rise to an anti-symmetric tensor in space-time. So this is an object with the two index, and uh, uh, and the two index are anti-symmetric. Okay. So similarly, the higher modes are all massive. For example, at the next level, next mass level, m square is equal to 4 divided by alpha prime. So any questions on this? On this anti-symmetric tensor, what is that? It's like a vector conjugate or something. It's an anti symmetric tensor. <laughs> but uh, what's the spin? Hmm? What's the spin? Um, yeah, normally uh, in the four dimension would be uh, something what we normally call one comma one, a representation of the Lorentz group. Yeah. Yeah, it's not it's not zero two. It's uh, yeah, it's uh, it's what we normally call one comma one. Yeah. Yes. No, no, this is just arbitrary. Uh, uh, yeah, so this is your, uh, uh, so this is your Hilbert, uh, so this is your state space at this level, right? And uh, so, so the general state will be linear superposition of them. And uh, those states, they transform uh, 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 separately under Lorentz symmetry, so we separate them. And uh, so for example, symmetric things, they transform uh, separately under Lorentz transformation under these guys. Yeah. So, so they should correspond to different space-time fields. So each of those each of those things should correspond into uh, 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 to a space time field, okay? Okay. So now let me just summarize what we have found. So we have found. So let's collect. The massless excitations we found, because as we will see, the massless excitation is the most important one. Yeah, let me also mention, yeah, let me just emphasize. In physics, it's always massless particle give you something interesting. OK? For example, here, even for d not equal to 26, those massive uh, particles, uh, as I said, maybe I did not emphasize, even for d not equal to 26, these massive particles, they do form into representations of Lorentz symmetry for any dimension. Only for those massless particles, OK? Uh, 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 something is funny. And so uh, of course, we also know the massless particles, they, uh, they give rise to long range interactions, et cetera. So now let's say, let's uh, uh, collect the massless particles. Massless excitations. So I will write them in terms of the space-time fields. So for the open string, 
essentially we find a, a massless vector field. Okay, so this is our photon. So at the moment, I put as a code photon because we we only find the massless particle. We we don't know whether this is our our own beloved photon yet. And for the closed string, then we find the symmetric tensor. So this is what we normally call the graviton. So again, coated. We find the massless spin two particle, uh, uh, which if you write in terms of field, would be a, 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 a like a gravi uh, uh, um, symmetric tensor, or B mu mu, which is anti-symmetric tensor. And now this mu mu, this all run in all space-time dimensions, okay? And then we have a phi. Then you have a scalar field. So, so this is just called anti-symmetric tensor, and this phi is called the dilaton. It's no uh, uh, phi, uh, uh, which is that scalar field. It's often called the dilaton. So, so far, even we call them photon, call this one photon, and the H mu mu, they are not, to call them photon and the uh, uh, graviton is actually a bit cheating because we don't know whether they really behaves like a photon or like a graviton. Okay, we just find a massless spin one particle and a massless spin two particle. But actually, there is something very general. One can say, just from general principle, just from general principle, one can show based on the Lorentz covariance. Lorentz covariance, and uh, say an absence of long physical states, etc. Say unitarity. Etc. Just based on those general principle, one can argue that at, at, at the low energies. And low energies, the dynamics of any dynamics of any massless photon, uh, massless vector field, should be Maxwell. And uh, for the graviton, uh, for the massless spin two particle, must be Einstein gravity. Okay. So that's why, if you say tomorrow, suppose you invent a theory yourself, I suppose that's a quantum theory, and that theory. Just happens you have a massive spin two particle, then you don't have to do calculations. Then you say, if my theory is consistent, this spin two particle must behave like a graviton. Okay. So are you saying that there's no other Lorentz invariant and Lagrangian you can write over such a particle? Yeah, essentially, just you can show at the low energies, it's always just based on gauge symmetry, etc. Uh, uh, the only thing you can have. Is those things? Yeah, it's Einstein gravity. Good. And this can be actually checked explicitly. So now let me erase those things now. Don't need them. So this can actually be checked explicitly. So in string theory, you can not only not only can you find the spectrum, you can also compute the scattering amplitude among those particles. OK? So as I outlined before, essentially perform pass integrals with some initial string states going to some final string state, et cetera. OK? So uh, of course, the, this will be too far uh, 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 for us. So we will not go into that. Let me just tell you the answer. 
So you can confirm this. So this expectation, this confirmed, is confirmed by explicit string theory calculation of scattering of these particles, OK? For example, let's consider, so we have uh, this spin, massively spin 2 particle, H, which I called H. So let's consider you start with the initial state with 2H, then the scatter to get you some two final state, which again H. So this is, uh, say, graviton, graviton scattering. Start with two graviton, scatter them. So in string theory, it will be, say, say at the lowest order, you will have a diagram like this. So a nice uh, uh, lowest order. I'm not drawing very well. Anyway, uh, uh, I hope this is clear. So you start with two initial string states. You scatter into some final states, OK? So this is a noise string series scattering diagram. You can, in principle, compute this using path integral, which I outlined earlier. Uh, of course, we will not compute this path integral. And uh, so you see there are two vertex here. One is proportional to string. You have two strings merged into one string. And then you have a, 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 a string then split into two. So there are two. To uh, uh, remember each of such thing uh, uh, corresponding to a G string, okay? So this would be the process in string theory. So this would be the process in string theory. So now, if you go to low energies, say low energies means if you consider the energy of the initial and the final particles to be much much smaller than one over alpha prime. So remember, one over alpha prime. Is the scale which go from massless to massive particles. So if you consider very low energy process, which E is much, much smaller than one of alpha prime, then the contribution of the mass. So in some sense, in the string, in this intermediate channel, when you go to from two initial state to two final state, this intermediate channel, the infinite number of string states can, uh, can, uh, can participate in this intermediate process. But in the process, but if your energy is sufficiently low, then from your common sense, well, you can do a calculation. And then the contribution of the massive state become actually not important. So essentially, uh, uh, what is important is those massless uh, uh, particles propagating uh, uh, between them. And then you can show that actually just precisely reduce to the Einstein gravity. It's precisely reduce to Einstein gravity. So more explicitly, so 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 yeah. So so when you go to low energies, then only massless modes, massless modes exchange dominates. Dominates, and then you find that the answer is precisely agree in the low energy limit. Agree with that from Einstein gravity, of course, you not only have graviton, you also have this B and the phi. They are also massless modes. So, so this is a, a slight generalization of Einstein gravity. It's, a general, it's Einstein gravity coupled to such B and the phi, OK? 
So in fact, you can write down a so-called low energy effective action. So so-called low energy effective action. So uh, let me call L E E here. Something like this. So phi is this phi here. And R is the standard rich scalar for the uh, 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 Einstein gravity. Okay. H is the three index tensor formed out of B. Okay. So, so H squared is just a kinetic term for B. So you can show, so more precisely, you can show that the scattering amplitude you obtained from the string theory, then you take a low energy limit. That answer precisely the same as the scattering amplitude you calculated from this theory, say expanded around Minkowski space time. Okay? So this is a, a Einstein gravity coupled to some scalar field. Okay? And so, yes? So what about higher loops or higher energies non perturbatively? Of course, then it will not be the same. Uh, this is no energies, OK? So, so let me make one more remark. Make one more remark. In Einstein gravity, Say like this, so Einstein gravity coupled to the matter field. So when I say Einstein gravity, I always imply Einstein gravity plus some other matter field, which you can add. So in Einstein gravity, such a scattering process, said so noise order, we all know is proportional to G Newton. OK, so this is the, the same G Newton, which Newton observed. And such a, uh, 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 yeah, let me call this, uh, 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 say, scattering for this is A4. A, a and then, then the scattering uh, for, the, uh, uh, for the Einstein gravity is proportional to, to G Newton. So this is uh, one graviton exchange, OK? It's proportional to Newton constant. This is attractive force between two objects. And uh, but if, if you look at this string diagram, then this string diagram is proportional to Gs square. So we conclude that the relation between the Newton constant and the string coupling must be G, G Newton proportional to Gs squared up to some, say, dimensional numbers or some numerical factors. OK? So this is a very important relation you should always keep in mind. So now here's an important point. E.G. Powell just asked, what happens at the loop levels? So, so you can compare the tree level process, etc. You find they agree very well. You say, what happens at loop levels? So now let me call this equation one. So at loop level, this one it's notoriously divergent. Say so if you calculate some scattering amplitude to the loop level, then find the, uh, 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 the, the result are divergent. In particular, more and more divergent when you go to more and more higher loops. OK? More divergent at the higher orders in perturbation theory, say, at the higher loops. So that's what we normally mean, say, a series is non normalizable So this tells you, say, if you take this gravity series, so this is just uh, essentially our Einstein gravity coupled to some fields. 
If you take the Einstein gravity, expand around flat space, quantize that spin two excitations, then that will fail. Because at certain point, you don't know what you are doing because you get all divergences, which you cannot renormalize. Really okay? You can normalize. So what this, of course, this does, what this tells you is that this equation itself likely does not describe the right UV physics. So that's why you see all these divergences, because you maybe ignore some more important physics, uh, which you cannot renormalize. Really But now you can go to the, so this is supposed to only agree with the string theory at low energies, which is the massive mode is in, uh, 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 are not important. But in string theory, there are this infinite number of high, uh, uh, massive modes, et cetera. So you find in string theory, if you do a similar loop calculation in string theory, the string loop diagrams magically are all UV finite. OK? All UV finite. So there's no such divergences. There's no such divergences. So, so this is the first hint. So this was the first hint of string theory as a consistent theory of gravity. And uh, 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 because at least at the perturbative level, at perturbative level, you can really uh, uh, quantize a, a massive spin two particles and uh, to calculate their physics in the self-consistent way. OK? Any questions on this? Yes? In that calculation, you had to use all those upper. Uh, yeah, 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 those uh, uh, are crucial. So that's why this kind of thing is not good enough because that does not have enough degrees of freedom. So in string theory, you have all these additional degrees of freedom that make your UV structure completely different. Yes? Can you take that V action and cut it from above on one or out of the scale? Would it like, approximately match the exact result? No, it's a, uh, yeah, so, so this will work as what normally works as a low energy effective theory. Uh, uh, not only work as if uh, uh, only effective when you uh, when you cre uh, when you consistently uh, uh, integrate out uh, uh, the massive modes, and uh, yeah, so, uh, so 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 even at loop level, this can capture indeed at no energies. Even at loop level, this can capture uh, uh, some of the string theory uh, uh, um, results, uh, but but you have to uh, renormalize properly, etc. Yeah. Yes. So does this imply that for like large objects, not things on on these very small scales, that we should reproduce Einstein's the Einstein field equations? Yeah. Does that okay? So yeah. This yeah. is sufficient to show that. Yeah, that's what it uh, uh, tells you. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. For example, uh, um, if you measure the the gravity between you and me, you won't see the difference. Right. Okay. Yeah. Actually, you will see a difference. <laughs> Uh, so this theory is a little bit different because of this massive scalar field. I see. So, so, so when you, so, so in ordinary gravity, uh, 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 the attractive force between you and me just comes from graviton. Right. But in this theory, oh, uh, uh, because this scalar is massive and, uh, uh, and actually have additional attractive force. And so this theory is actually not the same. Uh, 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 so this theory, even though it's, trivial, uh, very simple generation of Einstein gravity, but actually give you a different uh, a gravity force. So, so that's why if the string theory is going to describe the real life, somehow the scalar field has to become massive. So some other mechanism has to make the scalar field massive. I see. Yeah. yeah, of course, we also don't observe B mu mu, and this also has to become massive. I see. And, and will we really? Uh, find out that mechanism to make it massive? Yeah, uh, um, so this is, uh, uh, yeah, so this is the one of the very important questions since early days of string theory. People have been uh, trying to look for all kinds of mechanisms to do it, et cetera. Yeah. So, so there, there is an agreed upon way of doing this, or is it still sort of have kind of? Uh, <laughs> it depends. Yeah, uh, 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 this goes to a lex point. 
Yeah, uh, uh, yeah, uh, 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 wait for my next point. Yes? Yeah, how do we know that this effective uh, theory couples to other fields as Einstein's theory does through covariant derivatives? Um, so what do you mean? Uh, you can add um, uh, 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 the coupling between them, this and the gravity is through the, yeah, here I write this one, uh, here, you, of course you should use covariant derivative. Yeah. Yeah, uh, uh, here I did not, uh, yeah, I'm not uh, uh, very careful in defining this, but here you use covariant derivative, et cetera, yeah. What about, uh, what about coupling to the open strings or to photons or to, you know, matter? It will be the same thing. Uh, uh, that's what you would expect, I don't know, I'm just saying, uh, 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 it just general, it just uh, uh, governed by general covariance. Just general covariance have to arise at the energies. So that general principle is effective for uh, including matter as well? Yeah, yeah, then you can check, they can check, at it's a string theory, uh, anything you can check is consistent with that principle. Good, so now it's a lot of points. So, so let me just make a side remark on the physical uh, consequence of this scalar field. So we see that this scalar field is important because, the, uh, 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 because it uh, uh, actually can mediate, say, attractive force. Uh, but actually, there's another very important uh, role this, uh, 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 this scalar field does. is that if you look at this knowledge effective action, so let me now write this uh, G Newton as one over G string square. Then this have the structure proportional to one over G string square times exponential minus two phi, okay? So now there's a very important thing. So now you see if phi behave non-trivially, and if you, uh, and this is actually multiply this guy, it's actually effectively, yeah, because this is multiplied by the, uh, by, uh, uh, by the Einstein scalar. So this effectively modifies your Newton constant, okay? So effectively modifies your Newton constant. So in, in fact, you can actually interpret this GS as the expectation value of this phi, okay? As the expectation value of this phi. Yeah, because if you can change your phi and then change your factor of GS, then the GS can be interpreted as, a, 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 as the expectation value of phi. So, so, so this is something very important and very deep. Because remember, GS is essentially the only, the only parameter in string theory. The only dimension is parameter in string theory, which characterizes the strength of the string. And now we see this constant is not arbitrary. It's actually determined by some dynamic field. Okay? So that actually means that string theory, there's no free parameter. There's no free dimension is parameter. Everything in some sense de determined by dynamics. So, so this is a very remarkable feature. So this makes people think in the early days of string theory that you actually may be able to derive the mass of the electron. Because there's no free parameter in string theory, so you should be able to derive everything from first principle. Yeah, uh, anyway, yeah. But this also creates a problem for the issue I just mentioned. Uh, again, this is a side remark, uh, 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 but this is a fun remark. So, so the top, uh, so string theory we mentioned before is a summation of a topology, and the topology is weighted by this G string. So if this string is small, then you only need to look at the lowest topology because of the higher topology are surprised by higher power of G string, okay? In particular, if G string become order one, then to calculate such a scattering, 
then you need to sum over all possible topologies. And then that would be an unmanageable problem, which we don't know how to do. And so, 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 uh, so, so we want G string to be very small, so that actually uh, we can actually uh, control this theory. Okay? But now we have a difficulty. But we also said we want the scalar field to, be, to develop a mass. We want the scalar field to develop a mass. And turns out it's actually not easy to arrange the scalar field to develop a mass and at the same time to make this expectation to be very small. Okay? And, uh, and actually, that turns out to be a non trivial problem. Yeah. Yeah, so it's actually not that easy. OK, so, so my last comment. I am still very. S yeah. so, so earlier we said the tachyon. So, so, the, for the, so, so what we described so far, this is called the bosonic string, because we only have bosons. Uh, we only have bosons. Uh, 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 it's called the bosonic stream. So this bosonic stream can be generalized to so, uh, uh, what's called the super stream theory. Called super stream. So what the super stream does is the following: after you fix this gauge, so after you fix in this gauge, again the super stream can be written as some covariant wall sheet theory with some intrinsic metric. And then in the superstring, after you fix this gauge, the watch sheet metric to be Minkowski, then the superstring action can be written as the following. You just essentially have the previously free scalar <coughs> action. But then you add some fermions. You add some fermions. Okay, you just add some fermions. So the reason you could add such, uh, so this is just some two dimensional fermions living on the word sheet. Some 2D, yeah, so this is a two dimensional spinner field living on the word sheet. So the reason you can add such a thing, because those things don't have obvious uh, uh, a geometric interpretation, so you can consider them as de describe some internal degrees freedom uh, uh, of the string. And uh, so this guy provides the space-time uh, interpretation of moving in the space-time. And those are just some additional uh, 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 internal degrees freedom on the wall sheet. It turns out by adding these fermions, actually things change a lot. Actually, they do not change very much. Uh, it, it, it turns out things does not change very much, because this is a free fermion theory. It's also very easy to quantize. And, uh, and everything we did before, just carry over, except you need to add those fermions. You need to also uh, quantize those free fermions. It turns out, when you do that, there are actually two different quantization scheme, quantization procedure, quantization process. Two different quantizations exist. So when you add these fermions with no tachyon, so you actually can get rid of tachyon by including these fermions. Okay. So then the lowest mode is the lowest mode is just the, your massless mode. Okay. And the reason that uh, you can have more than one quantization is that when you have fermions, and this is fermion defined on the circle. So fermion on the circle, you can define to be periodic or anti-periodic. So now you have some choices. And depending on whether you choose fermion to be periodic or anti-periodic, et cetera, and then the story becomes different. OK? And uh, 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 so I will not go into there. But in principle, just with enough time, in principle, now you can do it yourself. Because the just quantize free field theory. Actually, you still cannot do it yourself. Um, <laughs> Yeah, uh, there's still a little bit more subtlety than that. But the, but the principle is very similar. So, so in this case, you get rid of tachyon. So these two, pro, uh, this, this two procedures called, called type 2a and type 2b string. So they give you two types of string theory. 
One is called type 2A and uh, uh, one is called type 2B. So also another important difference, instead of d equal to 26, now only requires d equal to 10. OK? Quite a good 10. So now let me just write down the massive spectrum. So now, because you have fermions, now you actually, the, this space-time particle can also have fermions. Previously, it's all uh, bosonic particles. Now, by adding these Wolfschild fermions, it turns out this can also generate the space-time fermions. It can ge generate space-time fermions. And uh, so, so, so the, now the mass is spectrum. So now these are the lowest particles. There's no tachyon. So these are all now become all 10-dimensional fields. So for, for type 2A, again, you have this gra graviton. You have this B mu mu. Then you have this deleton. And then you have a lot of vector fields come from the closed string. And so this is for the closed string. Now you actually have a gauge field, also in the closed string, U1 gauge field, and a three-form tensor field. So you have three indices. Uh, fully anti-symmetric. Is, is okay. the gauge field just coming from the fermion bilinear? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, that's right. They're, they are related, actually, uh, they are related to fermion bilinears. Yeah. So those things are exactly the same as before. And then you get some additional fields. So these are normally called the Ramon-Ramon fields. OK. Uh, called Ramon-Ramon fields. And then you can also, uh, and then plus fermions. So we are not write down the fermions. It turns out that this theory is actually supersymmetric. So each of those fields, they have some super fermionic partner. So it's actually a supersymmetric theory. So then you also have type 2B. And uh, again, the bosonic thing, you have H mu mu, B mu mu, phi. And then you have a, a lot of scalar field chi. Then a lot of anti-symmetric tensor, C mu mu 2, and then a four-form field. Okay, So this, again, is so-called Ramon Ramon, then plus fermions. Okay. And then the low energy theory of them becomes so-called uh, uh, type 2A and type 2B supergravity. So these are supersymmetric series, and, uh, and then the corresponding to generation uh, of gravity for the supergravity. So we, did, we do not need to go into there. Um, yes? So if you were going to do string theory, for example, or like a, a generalization on membranes, as you had mentioned before, if you were doing this on two manifolds, would you also have to include any on contributions? You may. Oh, boy. OK. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Nobody has succeeded in doing this. Right. Yeah. Yeah, you may. OK, it's it, uh, um, uh, actually um, today I have to be particularly slow because the, um, I have the much more grand plan for today. Um, that also means that there's definitely, you can only do the first two problems in your PSAT. But only there's only four problems in your PSAT, but you can only do the first two. <laughs> so you want to submit the first two, or you want to wait until next week to do it all together? <laughs> <laughs> but if we, if we do all together next week, so how, how about the next homework? Yeah. Uh, one week later? Yeah. Hmm? OK. Yeah, yeah, then let's, uh, maybe then let's just defer to one week. Next Friday? Yeah, next Friday. Yeah, next Friday. Um, yeah, then the next time, so this, in some conclude our basic discussion of the string theory, or the, you essentially have seen the most of the magics of string theory, and uh, uh, even though it's very fast. <laughs> and uh, uh, so next time, we will talk about deep brains. 
and which is a, 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 a lot of piece of magic uh, from string theory. Yeah.